Gaines, um, Head of Front Office Development at Noble Group. And I'm joined by my colleague, Alexa Vukotic, who's the Head of Platform Engineering. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about how we deal with time series uh, data at, at Noble. Uh, Noble Group is a commodity trading outfit. It's primarily a, it's a global supply chain management firm. Uh, we've had explosive growth since 1987 with a, a bunch of diversified businesses. Uh, we've had a general historic IT strategy of buying off-the-shelf third-party products and then figuring out how to integrate them uh, within our estate. And we, as, a, as a result, we didn't focus terribly much on building out any in-house uh, developed software. That whole strategy has changed in the last uh, two years. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, one of the things that we've had to deal with uh, at Noble is that we've had a number of different trading systems across all of the different businesses in which we operate. Um, we've got a bunch of other, uh, we've got 10 trading systems in play. We've got 20 different um, systems around risk, uh, credit market, et cetera, trade flows, routing. Each system is responsible for managing its own data. So we've got a lot of duplication uh, and a very difficult time managing all of that data on behalf of the business. So the, the main vision that we had was really to consolidate all of this data and put together a strategy around that to find some common ground around what that data is, what it looks like, um, what is the nature of it. And so we had a massive group-wide or firm-wide effort um, around how we store data, how we manage it, um, how we query it. And as a result, we built out this, uh, we started to evolve this global data platform, internally we call that Stratus, and it's built on top of a microservices architecture. It's <coughs> dealing with what we refer to as polyglot persistence, where we look at, again, as mentioned earlier, the nature of the data. So we look at time series, we look at objects and reference data, and we have different data channels and underlying technologies to support those. So for time series, which we'll be talking about during today's session, uh, that's where we have Cassandra as the, as the backing underlying data store. And for objects, we have a self-describing object, um, transactional uh, object store, and that's built on top of Elasticsearch. And lastly, reference data is managed through a GraphDB Neo4j. So today, again, as mentioned, we'll be talking about our, our time series uh, DB. Um, we deal with a lot of different types of time series data. We deal with prices, with flows, um, with weather data, uh, fundamental data supply and demand. Um, and yeah, this will lead us into what the sort of requirements uh, that, that we had in this channel. So we wanted to start with the simplifying the data model. And to that end, we just wanted to have a single, simple model and not deal with uh, the sharding across different column families. We had to include observations, forecasts, um, and again, across all different classes of, of data. Uh, we needed to ensure that we had responses within a, a maximum of 200 milliseconds and that we're able to write an awful lot of data through this. So from our perspective, uh, at, the, at the moment, we're writing um, 1 million points per day, and that's growing. Um, and lastly, we needed the ability to version data, um, uh, version data that was of interest uh, to be versioned for various business needs. So not all data is versioned. So with that, I'll hand over to Alexa. Uh, OK, as, as David said, the key thing we wanted to achieve with storing time series data is to have a simple and unified data model. With that in mind, we started to think what is the minimum data model we need to store any, any time-based data informa information. And this is what we came up with. This is a CQL schema of our column family. Um, and it is very simple and very self-describing, really. We have a symbol and curve which define the row key we have a timestamp as, as a column key, and then we have a double value, which is the number that we observed uh, for that particular time series. Why the key has two components? Uh, we realized that a lot of data we have um, um, contains an instrument and target of what we are observing or, or recording, and also a variable of that 
uh, that can be different, but also need to be linked somehow to the original tar target. As an example, you can think of a weather station, uh, let's say London, and then you can measure different things in London, temperatures, max temperature, mean temperatures, precipitation, wind, wind direction, anything like that. In that sense, London would be a symbol or the target of observation and the uh, temperature or anything will be the variable of what we store would, would be stored here in the, in the curve uh, element of this model. And this can apply to anything else as well. So if you think about the prices, you can have you know, Brent crude as an instrument and then you observe different kinds of prices, open, close, ask, bid, as settlement and so on and so on. And, and also applies to any other type of data that we have. So very simple, very easy. Taking weather in, as an example, we have uh, keys are uh, quite en encoded for us because that's how you, our users understand them. So if you see here, this is our station. EGGL is a common weather code for Heathrow, for example. And p our users would know that. So that's why we, we include that in the key rather than just saying Heathrow. And the data looks like this. It's very simple. It's a time series data. You have a timestamp, you have a temperature, and these observed temperature, minimum temperature, Heathrow, during this period of, of this year. And we can do whatever we want with that data. We can plot it, graph it, and show it to the user in this, this format. All nice and easy. Very simple data model, but very simple data. This is just an observation. But we also have another big class of data that we have to cater for, which are the forecasts. When you talk about forecast, you have an additional time component that comes into place, the forecast timestamp. So we have a forecast timestamp, and then you have the actual value timestamps, which are, which are what the forecasts are for. So for example, today you'll make a forecast on a six hourly basis for the next two weeks, and then you'll do the, the same thing this evening, and then you get the same thing tomorrow, all for the same, same stations. So the question was then, what do we do with this data? How do we store this? This is how the data looks like. You can see the forecast dates here, and then the actual forecast times are in the uh, column headers, and then the, the, the observed, these are the temp temperatures, I guess. I think these are also forecasts for, uh, for Heathrow, but for a bit more summery or warm September time earlier this year. So how do we do, fit this into the model that we just described? Do we actually fit it? Do we have another model? We wanted to try not to have another model. We wanted a unified model, a single model to describe everything. So what, what could we do? We could have done something like this. In addition to the symbol and curve, which will be heat, row, and temperature, we can add the forecast timestamp to the row key, and then have the forecast, uh, the timestamps, the value timestamps as columns, and all, all the rest would be the same. And this would, this would work. It, it's basically pretty natural description. So it would look something like this. This is a bit, bit simplified, but you have a, your station, then you have a forecast. Uh, date as part of your key, and then you have timestamps up, up there for, for all the values. The problem we had with this is if, if you uh, want to fetch any piece of information from Cassandra, you have to know the row key. And in this sense, it will, you would have to know the timestamp of the forecast, which is not something we always know, and that hence you will have to have manage it somewhere else to map what are all the forecasts for this particular station. Forecasts are not uniform. They don't come in the same periods. They always, sometimes they run 10 past an hour, sometimes a half past hour. So it will be quite cumbersome to manage all that. So we said, okay, let's, let's, let's try not to do that. Is there is something simpler we can do. So the idea came, if you look at this table, which is how you would see forecasts, what about if you just pivot it? If you just replace columns with rows and rows with columns, you will get something like this. It's the same data, it's the same table. So how about if you, if you look at the Cassandra table like this? So to have the forecast date as a value, uh, as a key column key, and then encode the actual value dates, but encode them in such a way that you can semantically easily reconstruct them and understand them. And that's actually, when we talked about um, to our users of this data, that, that's actually how they see this data. They see it as a set of offsets from a, different, diff, uh, from a certain timestamp. So if you say forecast for um, 4th of December 2014, you are going to see forecast for six hours ahead, 12 hours ahead, 18 hours ahead, and all the way at two weeks, uh, up until two weeks. So th 
we could do this in that case. Station and variable stay is our symbol and curve. And we, what we add to the key, row key is the forecast offset. So it's six hours, H6 for six hours, for example, in this example here. And use the, the timestamp of the, when the forecast was actually made as the column key. So the keys are now look like this. So this is still Heathrow, understandable who, for, to anyone who understands the weather data. And it has addition of H6, which means six hours ahead. So you have H12. And you have a very well-defined semantical model that you can actually easily read what this actually means. So you can also have D1, which is a day ahead, or we, we, W1 for a week ahead, or any kind of offsetting or horizon format you want. And this is how would it look in Cassandra, if you want. So all data here, for example, so it says here, H60. So this is the temperature 60 hours ahead from that point in time. This is a 60 hour ahead forecast from that point in time, and so on and so on. So you can easily get data like this, which is basically how the, in this example, uh, six hour ahead, 12 hour ahead, and eight hour ahead data uh, forecast is moving through time. But what we lost in this model is uh, the visibility of the actual forecast on a given date. This is something that's used, I guess, a bit less often than, than the data that how we showed it here. But nevertheless, what we also needed is to be able to, to easily give to the user, give me the forecast for the 6th of uh, September. So give me this. In Cassandra, this means a slice query against a range of row keys, which are all semantically understandable, so you can easily construct them and then do this. And that's exactly what we did. We built something that user would easily get this kind of information as well, and it, this would look like this. These are the screenshots from our actual tool, uh, which David will talk about a bit later, uh, uh, briefly. But this is what the user would have to know. They'll have to know their station code if you want, the variable they want, and the forecast, for which forecast it want, uh, date they want it, and they will get a graph or a table or whatever they want from it. Behind the scenes, this function, there's a small DSL that we built on top of it, would do actually a slice query against the range of rows and reconstruct the, the actual forecast on the date. What is the benefit of this, this approach? It's, it's for the time series data that we deal, it's quite universal. You can actually apply it to anything you want. This is a weather forecast. We also saw previously weather observation, but we can do it for fundamental data, for example, uh, gas pipe flows or gas pipe flow forecasts or uh, power plant production, actual values or forecast of production. Anything of that sense, uh, of that sort would, would fit into this model. And what, what's also nice, also the price data, which is another big class of data that we deal with, also fits into this model. So if, you, if you, any one of you comes from finance, you might recognize this. Uh, so these are Brent crude contract futures closing prices uh, on a different days in, in um, November. These are monthly contracts. So these, these here are actually codes uh, used in finance for to describe months. So this is January, this is February, this is March in 2015. So, so Brent for delivery in January 2015, the price is $106 and so on and so on. But what, what typically people would like to get uh, from when they're doing finance analysis for pricing, they would like to see what they call the forward curve of a uh, Brent contract. A forward curve of Brent contract is this, one vertical slice of the data, which is very similar to the vertical slice we did, we, we seen, uh, when we did the show the forecast before. So in order to get this information, you would actually use exactly the same function and exactly the same code we did to pull the forecast. You could use a different symbol, obviously, because this is a symbol for Brent. This is the variable, the close price, and this is the forward curve of Brent as of two days ago. So what we got with this model is a very simple and unified, what's most important, model that we can rely on. It's one single table, one single column family, simple key, simple, simple row key, simple column key, and, and just double values. And it applies to everything we want to store. 
So we can handle all every user's needs for time, da time series data based on this very easily. It's also very performant. We'll touch that in a second, but it does work. Uh, there are a few drawbacks, obviously. Nothing is without them. And I'll just mention two here. One is that if you actually need a forecast for a particular date or this forward function as you want, you have to read multiple rows, which is obviously slower than if we did it the original way, where you can read only a single row and, and get it that way. What is uh, another drawback, potential, is that you have now limited the number of rows you have for a forecast, but the rows will become wider and wider. The more forecast we store, the rows will be wider and wider, which is generally not a problem. Let's say you take a forecast uh, on an hourly basis. Uh, that's, what, 24 hours a day times 30 times 365. That's, not, that's still not too much. Uh, when we started this, we said the goal was to store at maximum one minute ticks. For one minute ticks of prices, for example, uh, that's what, 60 ticks an hour, eight, hour, eight uh, hours a day of typical working day, 250 trading days typically, that comes about 100,000 points um, a year, which means it takes 10 years for us to get a million uh, columns in a row, which is still all right, but it is something we are thinking about and maybe uh, considering applying some sort of sharding of data uh, for, for that sort of um, volumes. So that's what our data model is. Uh, I'll now hand back to David just to show you a few nice cool bits we built on top of it, namely this DSL which allows users to easily query data without actually knowing the complexity or our, our model behind it at all. Right, so as Alexa mentioned, we, we built this DSL, and the reason we built it um, was to, to basically provide the traders and the analysts uh, a very simple way in which to, to, to operate on this data. Um, so we chose Antler, um, and you, this will give you an idea of what the, uh, the grammar looks like. Um, we've got, basically you can see more or less a line here for each of the functions that we make available through this grammar. And what we've done with this is we've, we've built through a Java service, um, we've built the, the implementation, and when a user provides a, a, a formula or a set of expressions, uh, that will get fed through, and what we'll do is we'll go through a two-pass parsing uh, process. And the first pass is effectively to determine what are the actual symbols for which we'll need to go back to Cassandra and fetch data for to then assign values to those variables or symbols for the second and final pass. Right? Um, so we've created this service, uh, this DSL fronted service that we can make, uh, that we make available through a number of different channels, through, the, through web apps, um, through Excel, uh, and obviously through um, various programming languages. And this gives you an example of the sorts of things that you know, our analysts and traders can, can quickly build. They can create these dashboards where they can store uh, formulas for a given graph and then uh, quickly assemble through a, a very simple tabbed interface. This is fairly rude or rudimentary. Um, and ultimately, this gives you an idea of what they come in and, and look at. They can quickly and easily, um, sorry, this is a bit hard to see at the moment. Isn't it? It, it does, yeah. But they can quickly and easily um, enter in uh, a formula and see how that evaluates um, to the right. Um, and it allows them to, again, as mentioned, apply all of those functions defined in the grammar um, and operate naturally on things. So for instance, if we're looking at an instrument such as uh, heating oil, HO, that happens to be its uh, root symbol. Uh, when you talk about um, futures, you would have something like HOC1, which is the first nearby contract for heating oil, or HOC2, which is the second nearby. If you want to spread, it's really quite simple. It's HOC1 minus HOC2, very normal, natural sort of way for, for them to express that. And in closing, I guess what we have at the moment is we have 12 nodes spread across three data centers, um, EMEA and, um, and NOAM. We are currently ingesting around one million points per day. Um, and 
we're seeing around 200 milliseconds uh, of a query time for formula. So are there any questions? Yep. Uh, yes, we have. So what we have is roughly 40 years worth of data, but it's, that's um, of end of day prices, which isn't in the end too much. There's 365 points a day. We also have for weather data, roughly I think data from 2007, which are, which are, which in most going to like to have a one hour forecast. Obviously, the more data you want the performance hit, you'll pay a performance hit really. But what, what tends to happen for analysis purposes is that, that if you want all of the data then you'll, you accept to wait for it if you want to run a model through it. But we have, because we have a natural order is, of, of column keys, if you want the most recent data to do some quick pricing on the day, then the performance, the, there is no penalty in performance. You can, the row can be as wide as you want and, and if you want last month, last year, something like that, it will be nearly constant performance in that sense. But yeah, the more data we have, the, it will be slower, but that's, that's just the nature of it, isn't it? So, uh, yep. Um, for that query where you had um, like Ford Kirk print. Um, yep. Do you, when, you're, when you're compiling that, do you keep the components of all the offsets that they know statically or do you put them up? So we keep, uh, because we have different types of offsets, we keep them, we treat the offset as a ref reference data, so we do keep them somewhere else, but we know we can easily translate from, from a particular curve what sort of offset do the, does it expect. So we know for, I don't know, uh, Heathrow forecast supplied by this WSI provider, we know they are, uh, they are made four times a day and they are six hourly, so we can easily get that information and then build the forward bit. Yes, yes. Yeah. So one of the reasons we're doing it this way is because we can easily know what, what the row keys should be. Because it is, um, obviously with every data set we, we work with the end user to see how, how they see the data so we can, we can store it basically in the same way so they can know it because that's more important than, than if we know it or not. But yes, we, we do, we have to be able to build all the constituents offsets based on the, just a single symbol but that data is kept somewhere else, yes. Yep. Sorry, can you, can you? Yep. <coughs> this, that is a production. That is a production. Uh, what we have for DEV and UAT, we have two nodes cluster in each of the regions which are separate basically so they can, developers can run against them basically. But we don't run obviously all those 12, yeah. Yep. Did you consider denormalizing the data so that you could have it in the after web queries Do you want to answer that? What was the question? Can you? Did you consider denormalizing the data so that you could kind of pivot it and, and replicate it so you could query both time dimensions? So guarantee. Yeah, as mentioned, I think we at the outset, we, we went through a number of different machinations of different data models. You know, we had a whole bunch of different ones along the way. And ultimately, we, we felt that it was simplest just to, to stick with one. And so long as we, I mean, because basically, if the DSL fronted, you know, um, the, the query path, that simplified the whole game for us. Um, and, but it's, it's not to dismiss, the, obviously, you could do this in many different ways. But for us, it just, it just simplified the whole thing. Yep. So you can say that again? How does your range queries work now? Um, because you have a column for each day. Um, so if you want to go across range days, Yeah, so, so, the, so if you want, let's say, a f forecast for, so if you want observations, that, that's just si as simple as date range. It's just you get the date range, you get the data for that date range. If you want a forecast between the two days, uh, then, then again, it is just a range only across a number of rows that are defined by the, by the offsets that we have. 
Yes, yes, exactly. That's, that's all we do. And then just return it as, as, as one curve, basically, like a synthetic one that we built. So if, I mean, if you if you talk about indices, they are they are what they are is just the observational data. There is no forecast element to it, so it's a single time time component. Yeah, so there will be a different there will be different rows because we know how we have the, uh, the row would be I don't know, FTSE index, let's say, and then you, you would have a different variables on it. Is it close the day? Is it ask, start, opening price, closing price, whatever it is. There will be completely different roles, completely separate from that perspective. <coughs> okay, I think, oh yes, sorry. Uh, to be honest, uh, we haven't evaluated it, no, no. We are, aware of, we are aware of its existence, but we haven't tried it out, no. At the time when we started, uh, it felt that this was, that was the most mature solution we can pick at that point. Obviously, it's nothing set in stone, but no, we haven't. <coughs> No, it's random. So you're on a, on a graphic uh, of all the future? So the thing, again, what we started using Cassandra because yeah, Cassandra is nice for, for time series. What we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So we didn't go a, any deep into the Cassandra. We knew what the model should look like, and we wanted to use that. But we haven't really even tried to optimize it even further. We wanted to see how this, it would work with what we have at the moment. It might be that we will evaluate, see if we can get with different partition, some different other features of Cassandra, which we are really not using at the moment. We get some, something better. But what we want to concentrate is just see how our model affects all that. So from that perspective, we only we, we started with something, which is very simple, so random partition, all the standard settings. And we kept using it, and it's still working for us, although we do have quite a lot of data now. So no, answer is no. So we roughly have um, uh, roughly a million per day. Obviously, they don't come all; they come in bursts. Uh, most of the data we get is, is a, for example, end of day prices from all the exchanges. So they will come. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we, to be honest, we don't have a metrics. We don't keep them, but we get everything as soon as we can, and we we. We don't have any complaints about latency. Weather data, we receive them throughout the day. So we have a forecast made at 6 a.m. where we get the data from the providers probably by 6.10. By next minute or so, it's all available to our traders. So we, to be honest with you, we don't have metrics, but we, we don't have any, any problems with any. Um, no yes, <laughs> yes, which is probably why we didn't even check. <laughs> Mm, an interesting question, probably one from our weather analysts. Uh, do you want to try? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be through the DSL that we've provided <laughs> very, very, very readily. <laughs> okay, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you.